I saw this tweet today from Austin Ivory. Um, my response to the four academics, including Max Beans, who critique papal stance on Ukraine by misunderstanding and distorting it. France's peacemaking position is firm and clear. Um, I just, it was an interesting article. I just thought I'd read it through um, because some people are, are accusing the Pope of, of not, of, of being, I don't know, being not being very clear about his stance on the Ukraine war. I mean, from what I can see, the Pope has been pretty clear that he's not uh, in favour of the invasion of Ukraine. Um, I suppose, are we looking at something like the Pope Pius XII situation where some people are accusing him of being not being more vocal about the regime back in the late um late 30s early 40s i don't know anyway let's i'll just read through this article here because it's uh i do find it interesting the points that austin are making uh the pope's clear position on ukraine uh war makes strange bedfellows and their first casualty is truth war is always the hour of darkness when disorder reigns brute force sets the rules and the innocent are crushed when human appetites lust greed, rage, revenge are unleashed and given free expression. What we hear is happening now in Ukraine is nothing compared to what later we will learn. When the full impact of Vladimir Putin's invasion is unveiled, if this war is like previous wars in human history, the victims will not be only on one side and the aggressors on the other. Just think of the more than 15,000 mothers in Russia unable to mourn their dead sons, many of them teenaged conscripts because Putin will not allow their bodies to be repatriated for fear of the impact of morale. The price for war is always paid by the poor and its profits are reaped by the wealthy who trade in arms. Absolutely correct. And we can all see the Lockheed Martin and all of these Western bodies making billions from it and the billions being sent to Ukraine. Anyway, going on. I write these opening paragraphs to name the truth that amidst the passions that wars arouse, we too often lose sight of the truth about the evil of war ex itself. Now imagine what Putin's propaganda machine could do with those paragraphs if it wanted to do. Pope's biographer says victims on both sides in Ukraine perhaps, or remember mourning Russian mothers, says Pope's biography, or how about Paul Pope US website calls Ukraine aggressor. Now comes the ethical question. If such headlines were now to appear in Russia, should where Peter is stop publishing me? Should I accept that careless talk costs lives, as the old World War II poster has, has it? Is it better to muzzle the truth rather than give succor to Putin's henchmen? While you consider that question, let me refrain it somewhat. What if those seeking to name these truths are not the relatively obscure and unimportant Austin Ivory or where Peter is, but instead Pope Francis and the Vatican. Uniquely among the world's leaders of nations or faiths, Pope Francis has spoken virtually every day since February 24th about the horrendous war. And Austin is right, Pope Francis has spoken of. He has named the truths about it and pleaded for an end to it. And every day, in ways that cannot always be made public, he has acted to try to bring it to an end. And for these things, he has now been criticised in a strange echo of conservative traditional critiques of Francis by four academics who claim that his words and actions are causing confusion and that he is opening himself to manipulation by Putin. This is perhaps the central irony in an ill-judged opinion piece signed by four academics and published by the National Catholic Reporter in the US and Il Reino in Italy. Thomas Bremer, Regina Elsner, Massimo Fagioli 
and Christina Schuckel praise Pope Francis for interrupting the 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 bid by Moscow Patriarch in the mid 2010s to forge a holy alliance with Catholic conservatives and traditionalists against Western liberal values. Yet they argue that by continuing to seek dialogue with Patriarch Kirill and by failing to make clear where the Catholic Church stands in Ukraine, Pope Francis risks letting it through the back door those forces of reaction that he has tried to fend off inside his own church since 2013. Ironic, because the strategy of traditionalist critics of Francis has been precisely to claim that Francis has failed to dispel confusion over divorce or gay marriage or abortion, and that in failing to clarify the church's position, he has given succor to, or even been manipulated by, the enemies. Writers for this site and other veterans of these polemics know what that Pope Francis's positions are precisely those of the Church and the living tradition of the Catholic faith. We also know that, far from being unclear, Pope Francis's message has a clarity that scandalizes because it exposes just how far the ideology of the critics is from the Gospel and the authentic Catholic tradition. To see the same tactic deployed by these four academics is disheartening. Let us hope they are not scandalized for the same reason. So it's very interesting to see Massimo Fagioli and others, you know, going going after Pope France a little bit that he's not very clear in what he's saying, because a lot of Catholics have really asked Pope Francis to come out and say, well, what do you ac- actually believe in? What are your um what are your actual views on certain topics? Uh, for example, uh, we, we've seen the what's going on in Germany and some people have wondered, well, what does Pope Francis agree about certain things? Now, Austin is saying that Pope Francis has always, what is, uh, his position is the constant teaching of the Catholic Church. Uh, we don't know. For sometimes it's very strange because uh, uh, you would wonder... Um, especially uh, given what we've seen in Amoris Laetitia, which seems to be very different to what previous popes said. Um, I don't know. It's, we we'll suppose we'll see. But anyway, let's go on with this. The other irony of that piece is that while highlighting Putin's distortions of Francis' statements, they grossly distort those same statements. For example, they say that his Corriere della Sera interview on May 3rd, the Pope claimed that NATO expansion compelled Putin to unleash the invasion in Ukraine. Francis, of course, said no such thing. He said that NATO's expansion provoked, the actual word he used was facilitated, Putin's ire, a statement of fact that will be in every historical account of the war. A warmonger needs a moral justification and will latch onto a grievance to find it. NATO's expansion, which nationalists in Russia see as an existential threat and the fruit of broken Western promises, provides Putin's... Francis simply said so. More bizarrely, the four academics claim that the Vatican has a policy of balancing out, that it sees the invasion as a geopolitical conflict of interest between Russia and the US and views Russia as defending a legitimate national security interest. Those slurs for which they provide no evidence beyond a study by a body called the Russian Academy of Science, which labels the Vatican's position soft when compared to the speeches of European politicians. The academics quote the study's claim that the role of the Catholic Church is mostly interpreted as understanding of the Russian side. Interpreted by whom? They do not say. If they are referring to Russia, then this is a very circular argument. And what is meant by soft? Is it true that in the, we- in the early weeks of the war, Francis-, Francis was careful not to join the increasingly bellicose condemnations by the West of Putin's inv- invasion? His statements were measured, yet devastatingly accurate. In keeping with the Vatican's diplomatic tradition, 
he avoided saying Putin or Russia by name in order to leave open a, a chance, however slim, of a dialogue. But this does not mean Francis has avoided naming the truth of what is happening consistently and repeatedly. For example, he described the invasion as a perverse abuse of power and partisan interests, which condemns defenseless people to suffer all forms of brutal violence. It would be odious to list all the ways that the Pope has condemned the brutality, the inhuman and sacrilegious cruelty of the invasion, this cruel and senseless war, and his many pleas for it to end. Soft is not the adjective that springs to mind. For anyone interested, journalist Felipe Dalvires has helpfully gathered the Pope's public statements about the war in his blog. If academics say Francis is not explicitly placing responsibility for this horror at the feet of Putin, Putin, they should read his address to politicians and diplomats in Malta. In it, the Pope denounced how some potentate sadly caught up in the anachronistic claims of nationalist interests is provoking and fomenting conflicts. Did anyone think he is not referring to Russia? When the Observatorio Romano's front page showed a, fo a, a photograph of a dead body in Bucca, below the headline quoting Francis, the spirit of Cain, could anyone really claim not to know whom Francis believes is possessed by that spirit? The, that these statements are being ignored or distorted by Russian state propaganda is not in doubt. But what is the Pope supposed to do about it? Post-truth manipulation by vested ideological interests is hardly confined to Russia. Just think of what the so-called Catholic media in the United States do to filter out and distort Francis's teaching. Yet it has never stopped him proclaiming the truth he sees and teaches. Should Pope Francis not say the truth what the church teaches? Um, it's very interesting that Austin Ivory is saying he proclaims the truth that he sees and teaches. And this is kind of the problem here. Um, we've had popes being very clear about certain, certain issues and now we have a pope that is very silent on other issues. Um, and it's quite, it's a little bit disconcerting in the church. Um, and I suppose there'll be a lot of debate about it. But anyway, just go on with this article. I think that what really drives the four academics is revealed only at the end of the article, where there are references to ecumenism they believe Francis should be exercising. The short version is, they want him to cut off relations with Kirill and throw in his lot with the Orthodox who have done the same. And they worry that the Pope is not doing so out of some self-interested ecumenical gambit. They use a lot of the words to say a Vatican that continues to dialogue with Moscow hierarchy, ignoring all the other articulations of the Russian Orthodox Church in and outside the borders of the Russian Federation and ignoring the autocephalous Orthodox Church in Ukraine, risks enormous damage to the ecumenic pro project, they begin. Then they say that while the Pope puts hope in ecumenical dialogue, with the current leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church, they believe he is wrong because the preconditions of this dialogue are missing a commitment to peace, to the value of human life and truthfulness. You think from the first quote above that the Pope talks only to Kirill and ignores the Orthodox leaders in Ukraine. This is certainly not true, but if it were, it would be because the Patriarch, not they, have some power to bring the war to an end. You think from the second quote that Francis has was engaged in the endless scholastic discussions with Kirill, perhaps about the experiential vision of God as attained in the Theoria and Thesis, or maybe the Filioque Clause, while the shells were landing in Mariupol. Yet Francis's 40-minute Zoom call with Kirill was about the invasion. When the patriarch attempted to justify it, it was a just of war, Francis completely rejected any such notion. Further, Pope Francis warned Kirill that he was Putin's altar boy, a, a state cleric trading the gospel for worldly interests. Should Francis even have this dialogue? The four academics think not. 
they think he should break off all relations with Kirill and Russia, which is what some Ukrainian nationals and some of the autocephalous Orthodox Church of Ukraine want him to do. This is also the view of sociologists, theologians and ecumenists behind the op-ed are articulating, if not representing. They badly misunderstand the Pope's peacemaking role. As Fa Fabrizio Mastrofini points out in his recent piece in, the, in Il Riformista, the Pope is not promoting passivism in the political sense of the word, renouncing the use of force. His message is peacemaking in the gospel sense, looking to a different logic to resolve the conflict, one that starts with mutual recognition. For Francis to cut off Kirill, and Putin in a blast of rhetorical combination is war logic and would only harden that logic even if it were not used for some of the West it, even if it were not used by some in the West to claim a spiritual mandate for escalation it would absolutely confirm the Russian nationalist claim that Francis is NATO's chaplain and that Christian Russia stands alone, besieged by enemies. More importantly, if Francis were to follow that course, it would be to renege on the Pope's gospel-mandated role in this conflict, to name the truth of what is happening, and to stand clearly against the logic of war as any kind of solution. Ukraine's right to self-defence may be clear, but so too is the devastating spiral of escalation. For the brutal truth is that longer this goes on, the more weapons will flood in. Outrages will continue to pile upon outrages, and the harder it will become to escape what Francis calls the diabolical and perverse logic of weapons. St. Paul, John Paul II famously described the war as un'aventura senza ritorno, a venture from which there is no return. A downward spiral of violence. That is why, even while Ukraine is morally justified in fighting to protect its homeland, this cannot be, even for Ukraine, a just war. War as a means can never be just because it sacrifices the poor and the innocent, and so is always an injustice. Francis names the, this truth and defends the other logic. logic God's logic, the path of mercy. Even after most of us have given up on it, God's logic recognises the depth of human relationship. It demands our mutual recognition as, as fellow creatures. God's logic is that we are, are all, call, all still united by a shared dignity in spite of the horrors that have been inflicted on each other. When God, willing, the guns start the guns fall silent, there will still be someone in the world with immense moral standing who can step in and remind people of this truth that war has blinded us to. In the meantime, this means being open to Kirill, however ghastly and corrupt he may be, because it is Kirill who might have a chance to stop this war. The Pope knows and has said this extremely un this is, ex is a extremely unlikely for now, but the gospel demands that he continue to try, not for the sake of some far-off ecumenical gain, but so that the raped women of Ukraine and the children fleeing bombs need scream no longer. The Pope's stance needs no clarification. It could not be clearer. Amidst the roar of weapons and cries of grief, he stands among the victims their blood on his cassock begging for peace and ready to talk to anyone and to do anything to bring it about. So the end of the Pope's clear position on Ukraine by Austin Ivory. So what is my opinion after reading all of that article? I, I tend to agree with Austin that you know, we, we have we have to look at the example of previous popes who took a very difficult stance, which is uh, not the general political stance that the world has and, and the, the Vatican's political 
um, the way of working is different, has always been. And it's not just Pope Francis. The previous popes have done this as well. Um, is it how will history judge him? I have no idea. Um, we, we've seen how history judged uh, Pope Pius XII. There are Catholics in every country of this world. And for any pope to come down uh, to cut off relationships with regimes that are, you know, difficult to stomach, it, it isn't easy. I mean, that's just my thoughts on it. But I suppose let's see how history will judge Pope Francis here. But I just thought this article was really interesting. I was reading through it. Um, and it's strange, you know, the, to see to see some people being spoken about in this article. Uh, Massimo Fagioli and Austin Ivory kind of uh, at loggerheads here a little bit. Um, but I, I do think if we look, if we reflect on and how Pope Francis has spoken about this war. He is clearly uncomfortable with this war. He is clearly against it. He is clearly. I mean, we've seen this from day one. Uh, it, 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 Pope Francis is, is um, for anyone to say that he's NATO's chaplain or uh, or he's pro-Putin, really doesn't add up, doesn't stack up. Um, not in my opinion. He certainly isn't. He just wants this... this madness to end anyway just my thoughts i shared this article let me know what you think in the comments and like and share this take care god bless bye bye